17. Just a, a music stand's great. Oh, all right. Good morning, church. So good to be with you guys this morning. Thanks, Pastor Glenn. Okay. Ah. Well, praise the Lord. It's good to uh, be together um, in fellowship this morning. And um, I'm just delighted to, uh, to be able to share with you. Would you pray with me as we get started? Our our great and good Father, uh, we come before you this morning to give you thanks for fellowship, uh, to give you thanks for your tender mercy and kindness toward us, to give you thanks for giving us your Son, that we might come into a reconciled and right relationship with you. Father, we are humbled by that gift. We receive it with glad hearts. And we ask, Father, this morning uh, for your blessing on the, the preaching and teaching of your word and on the stories that will be shared to, that give glory to you. Um, Lord, we thank you that you're at work in our lives, that you've given us your Holy Spirit as a deposit in us, guaranteeing our inheritance in you. And um, Lord, we, we just want to give you thanks uh, that we're your children, that we're your sons and daughters, that you love us and you care for us. So, Lord, we just want to turn our attention to you this morning. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to be in, in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11 this morning. If you would go with me there, um, <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to, I want to read the passage, and then I want to um, share some, some thoughts on that passage, and then maybe some uh, examples um, of how God is, is stirring uh, in me, I think, a response to that passage and, and maybe even some encouragement to you in the same manner. <clears throat> Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 1 through 11. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him, and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Over 300 years ago, Thomas Boston, a young Scottish fly fisherman, wrote in his diary, January 6, 1699, 
reading in secret, my heart was touched with Matthew 4.19. It's a parallel passage. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. My soul cried out to the accomplishing of that to me as I was very desirous to know how I might, be, I might follow Christ. So as far as to be a fisher, fisher of men. And for my own instruction in that point, I addressed myself to the consideration of it. Well, Boston later wrote a little booklet entitled A Soliloquy on the Art of Man Fishing, in which he spelled out his considerations based on what he was learning <clears throat> from following the great angler, the fisher of men. Well, I grew up, um, I grew up fishing for steelhead on the Rogue River in southern Oregon. Um, and since my childhood, I haven't done a lot of fishing since. I haven't made time for it. However, it seems to me that having thought about fishing uh, and the relationship between the two, um, fishing for fish is very similar to fishing for men. Uh, but analogy can only take us so far. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Boston's way is better by far, for he points us to the Lord that we would learn our tactics from him. Excuse me, I have to cough. <coughs> Excuse me. Um. Can I get some water, please? Yeah. Thank you, Angel. <coughs> Excuse me for that. Um, God's ways are better than our ways. And as we consider and contemplate his ways. Uh, one of the great stories from Scripture is this passage in, in Luke uh, chapter 5. Uh, the old versions call it the great draught of fishes. Um, <clears throat> it's incredibly simple and yet profound in its shrewd revelation of God's ways. Um, the story begins one early morning. Jesus is walking on the shore of Lake Gennesaret as he often did to get away from the city and the crowds. And he came upon these uh, fishing, <clears throat> fishing friends from Capernaum. Thank you very much. Pastor. Yeah. I hope that will serve me well here. Okay. Um, so Peter and Andrew are there. If you can imagine the scene, they're there, they're washing their nets, right? And it's been a long hard night of fishing. They're cleaning all the garbage out and they're scrubbing their nets and they're preparing them for the next night's fish, fishing. Um, these men, experienced fishermen, commercial fishermen at that, though they were, had fished all night and caught exactly nothing. Nothing. I don't know if you've been in that situation. It can be discouraging or frustrating depending on how you receive it, but they caught nothing. And as Jesus stood watching there, I assume maybe praying for these two men, a crowd begins to gather. And they often did that. And they seated themselves on the ground around Jesus and they awaited his instruction. Jesus made straight for Peter's boat, gets in it, asks him to put off a little to shore, and he gets in the front of the boat and he begins to teach the people. And his instructions uh, were not so much Luke's concern in this particular passage. He doesn't share what Jesus taught. At least Luke's recording doesn't. He only tells us that he said to Peter as he dismissed the crowd, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. If you can imagine Simon having been scrubbing the nets, long night, fishing, no success. Ugh, Lord, really? Master, we've worked hard all night. We haven't caught anything. I understand as fishermen, um, you don't want advice <laughs> from anybody. I, I know that I don't, and I don't fish that often any, anymore. But um, no matter how well-intentioned it is, as a fisherman, you typically don't want input. And if you do receive it, you might give a platitude and then quietly move off upstream where you can go be by yourself. Um, <clears throat> So imagine Peter, this veteran fisherman, receiving this word, and he understood fishing as few of us do, probably. 
uh, he knew that in the morning the fish schooled in the shallows. And the deep water was, that's not where you're going to find fish. He knew that other fishermen, kind of the consummate critics that they are, <clears throat> that they're going to see Peter in his boat putting out at that hour of the day, it's probably late morning, laden with nets and preparing to go fishing, that they would scoff at him. Peter, despite his embarrassment and his uncertainty, though, he did exactly what Jesus told him to do. He and his partner, Andrew, probably, put out to sea and let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And, <clears throat> well, you know the rest of the story, right? Right? They tell James and John, hey, come over and help us. The other boat comes over. They start filling it with fish. And, and the next thing you know, they start to sink. When Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he cried out, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For as Luke goes on to tell us, he and all of his companions were so astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And then, and really only to Simon, Jesus said to him, don't be afraid. We discussed that this morning in the Sunday school hour. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So here's the lesson. The best man fishers in the world are those who don't really know what they're doing. All efforts at communicating the gospel, gospel must begin with that certainty. Um, <clears throat> it, it's, it's fun to come to church and to be able to share things that God is doing, but I will be the first one to tell you it comes out of a lot of failure, and it comes out of a lot of trial, and it comes out of a, a lot of um, not really knowing <laughs> what I'm doing. Um, but knowing that God loves people, and he desires for us to engage them. Peter's sin lay in being sure of himself. He knew how to fish. It was his job, and he was good at it. He'd been doing it for a long time. Undeterred by Peter's abilities, Jesus challenged him exactly where he was maybe most proficient, in his greatest strength. And he showed him, really, that he knew nothing about fishing. He let Peter fail as the very thing he did best, at the very thing that he did best, so he could learn to succeed at his greatest enterprise, and that would be fishing for men. Jesus was turning the tide here. <clears throat> Ray Stedman said this about Peter's failed night of fishing. The night of failure was not without its lessons and benefits. We can do worse than fail. We can succeed and be proud of our successes. We can succeed and literally burn incense to the net. We can succeed and forget the hand whose it is to give or withhold. Peter worked all night long on his own without reckoning on the resources of the one who has dominion over the fish of the sea and who swim the paths of the seas out of Psalms. This time when he let down his nets after Jesus told him to put out into deeper water, Jesus must have issued a call to the schools of fish scattered all over that lake and drew them irresistibly to Peter's net. Peter didn't need to read the water or make the right presentation with his bait or his hook. He didn't need to get himself to the right place at the right time. That was all Jesus' business. Peter's waywardness lay in his confident belief that he must lure the fish. He must draw them in. Peter's sin is the sin that plagues all of us. We believe that if we can perfect the art of man fishing, get our theology straight, get our apologetic persuasive, get our pat down pat, men and women, boys and girls would come into our nets, but it isn't that way. We know what it is uh, to fish all night, and catch nothing. Maybe that's your story too. I know it's mine from time to time. 
Again and again, we return with our empty nets. But when we enter into partnership with Christ, when we make ourselves wholly available to Him, He does the rest. Our business is to stand and wait, maybe like that cat with the wide eyes, alert and attentive, ready to be used. If we get ourselves ready, our chances will come. God will get us to the right place, to the right person, at the right time, and give us the right things to say. On the day of Pentecost, though Peter wasn't expecting much, he let down his net, and God filled it with 3,000 souls. In the house of Cornelius, Peter had barely put his net in the water when this hard-living, unlikely pagan jumped in. You guys, we are in partnership with the Lord Jesus. And when we do that, astonishing things can happen. I'd like to share some stories, uh, some fishing stories, and I will try not to embellish. <clears throat> I've got some pictures, and maybe we can go ahead and... and the first one, I guess, my, my family. Um, uh, I will save any updates maybe for the lobby area. Um, some of the stories that I'd like to share are about some of these students, and I'm going to step back so you maybe you can see. Um, can you go ahead and flip to the next one? Um, this is Ibrahim. He's from Oman. I met with him for about two years. I'm only going to share a couple stories, but I just want to point out some of these students that I asked you to pray for, and it's in the bulletin this morning too. Go ahead and next one. This is Dagon. He's from South Korea. He has a story about his father meeting the fire spirit. As I've learned, it's the Holy Spirit of God that his father has met. He came to the U.S. to learn about religion. Dagon and I have met every week this year. This is an apple cider press party that we did. Next slide. Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, our family and like 16 students. Next one. So this is uh, Takuya and Genki and Powe. Uh, these guys are from Japan. Powe is from tai, uh, Taiwan. Um, students that I've had a chance to meet with all year long. Next one, just a game party that we did. This is Jonathan from Panama, me. Ab Abdullah in the middle here with the jacket and the red shirt. He's from Saudi Arabia. Uh, next one, <clears throat> Shannon teaching uh, or how to make apple pies. Uh, this is, uh, again, Genki and Powe and Iroha and uh, Takuya Iroha, the, I guess the third one in. She lives with us now, has lived with us this whole year, or this whole term. Next one. Yeah. This is Xiao Xin and Jie, a couple Chinese guys who were so utterly delighted to have me in their home to, uh, to share tea, and they made some uh, food from their province in China. Next one. Yeah. Ryosuke, we taught him how to play cribbage. <laughs> Next one. Yeah. Took a bunch of... Uh, how many of you know who Ichiro is? Yeah, right? Ichiro, right? How many of you know who Otani is? Shohei Otani. He's the new slugger slash pitcher that uh, plays for the Angels. The Angels were in town, and so the Japanese students, these couple national icon heroes, they were like, we've got to get to the game. And so we took students to Seattle, and, and uh, well, they got pictures with Ichiro. It was pretty cool. Next one. Yeah, so while we're in Seattle, uh, Silas came with us on the trip, and then Shannon and I, and then uh, about eight students. So next one. We recently took a trip around southern Oregon to Crater Lake and then up uh, to uh, Bend area. And um, so Dawood is right here in the middle. He's from Saudi Arabia, a very good friend. Uh, two guys here, Riohe and Jean, are going to stay this whole year. And so... Um, the rest of those students are all leaving next week. We're throwing a barbecue on the 14th, so coming up next uh, Thursday. Next slide. In the middle or in the bottom of a cave in Bend. Uh, this is at the furthest reach, 0.8 miles down the cave tube. And we're taking pictures, and Silas and his friend Micah, my daughter Jesse and Quincy, and then some of the other students that got in the picture. Next one. And this is, uh, we hiked Misery Ridge. Doesn't sound fun, right? Smith Rock State Park. 
and uh, we went climbing up there. Next one. Okay, so I'll stop right there. Stories. Um, I'll be the first one to say, not a single one of those students you just saw a picture of know the Lord Jesus Christ is um, any more than a name. Any more than a name. Um, last year, and for the last 16 years, I've been working with American students, many of whom have known Christ and are growing in their relationship with Him. This year we made a switch to work with international students, and I went from like 95% believing students to now 95% non-believing students. It's been a remarkable change for me. I'm learning. I was talking to Dan Cummins in here. There you are, Dan. Earlier, I, I'm learning so much. I, I, I feel like I'm fishing in new waters. And um, I'm having to learn how to trust the Lord in a new, day, in a new way. Um, I'm having to learn to be faithful, even when it's discouraging. Um, I, I'm just, I feel like the Lord is, is refreshing in me a sense of like, Jason, I'm in control here, not you. You just be faithful in what you're doing. Um, and and it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a tough year, but an exciting year. I'll say that. Uh, I want to share two stories real quick. One is Dawood. Dawood is a Saudi Arabian student. Um, Dawood is, is Shiite Muslim. Um, the majority of Saudi Arabia is Sunni Muslim. And Dawood uh, comes from uh, a, a place in Saudi Arabia that he is marginalized in his own people. It's really interesting talking to him. He's got a heart for God. Uh, even right now, we're in the mi- middle of Ramadan, and he's fasting because he wants to draw close to God. Uh, he desires righteousness. He desires holiness. He doesn't know the Lord. He doesn't know what has been done on his behalf. And as we've talked, I, I just remember back to a, a situation two and a half months ago, spring break. He had some time, I had some time. And we sat down together with the scriptures and the Quran. And for four hours, looking back and forth, and I'm trying to communicate to him that Jesus has already accomplished what you are trying to fulfill in your own flesh. It's been a really interesting track. We've had a lot of really good conversations, but he hasn't come to know the hope of Jesus. Um, Maybe you know friends like that. Maybe you know people who are steeped in sin, who are separated from God. Maybe they're earnestly wanting to know God. Um, I'm trying to figure out how do I communicate Christ to this young man. I just want to encourage you, be faithful in those conversations. Continue to, to offer to them the hope that you have with gentleness and respect. I'll share another story with, uh, with you guys, another, um, another individual named Esperanto. I don't have any pictures of him. Uh, Esperanto is 53 years old. He's a college student. He's come here to learn English. He's a successful electrical engineer from China. He's designed cell phones. He's got lots of money. He's made a life. He's come here because he wants to learn English. He wants to learn language and culture. And um, he's brought with him his two 11-year-old twins. His 16-year-old and his wife are still in China because they haven't been able to get a visa here. Um, Esperanto is here and he is very emphatically declared on a number of occasions, I am an atheist. And <clears throat> when I hear that, I think to myself, what do you mean? That you don't believe, that you choose not to believe, or that you just, you can't even fathom the idea that God is. So we're talking one day, and he's asking me questions about my worldview and about um, how I would deal with conflict, and just all kinds of really interesting, obscure kind of questions. And I said, Esperanto, you need to understand that my frame of reference and the way that I would answer these are based on a very presupposition that God is and that he loves us and that he desires for us to know him. And when I shared that, he goes, yeah, I cannot believe this. Now, we've continued to meet and... And 
everything that he brings up, whether it's the care of his children, whether it's his frustration with language or a, a, a tutor or an instructor, um, how, to, how to solve problems about just daily life necessities. I'm like, I filter all of that through what I believe Esperanto. So he's torn up right now. I hope I'm not going too long, but he's torn up right now because he wants his 16-year-old to come here. But he can't get a visa here because he studied in a different country and, and there's some other policies with China and stuff. But he's torn up and he's trying to figure out how can I bring my family back together. And, and so um, I'm talking to him about hope and about holding out hope and being patient for the process to work. And he, at one point, he stops and he puts his hands in his head, his head in his hands, and he says, I, I just can't believe. And I know in my heart that he's wrestling with the very question of, is God, does he, can he be known, and can I know him? He, he's, he's asking these questions in his soul. And, and I'm just praying, Lord, have your way in this man. Have your way in this man. It, it's fascinating to watch the whole process happen. Maybe like a fisherman who throws his hook in the line and is just waiting for that fish to stop nibbling, but actually to take the take the bait. And I'm I'm not saying that in a like a, a bait and switch kind of thing, as much as like the word of God, the hope of, of salvation, eternity uh, with a loving father is is it, it's there for him. But he's, he's kind of, in a sense, a fish swimming around it, trying to look at, is this really what I want to take? And I'm just praying, and maybe you can pray with me, that the Lord would so move in his life um, that he would respond in faith. <coughs> um, I'll give you a little bit more update on Esperanto. He, uh, he has sought to go to Santiam Christian and ask them if they can possibly sponsor his son, his 16-year-old, on his own independent visa to come to school uh, here so that their family can be re reunited. I've been walking him through that application process, and he's, he's making steps. Uh, possibly by the end of August, he'll, he'll have his family here. Um, <clears throat> would you pray with me toward that end? Uh, I'm really struck at times, um, and I think about Peter in that boat, and, and what did he, when he was in that boat and he realized the, the fish, and he turned to the Lord and he says, go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. Um, I think he's, he's caught up with the reality that he is utterly insufficient in himself. And he's before a holy God who is, powerful and mighty to do what he is incapable of doing. And, you know, honestly, whether it's with your coworkers or your friends, maybe even your family members or these international students, we're all in that place together. And um, I, I just, I, I guess I want to encourage you um, to continue to fish, continue to look for new waters, to cast your nets, but do it in a way that you're trusting and wholly dependent on the Father for what he might want to do. Um, may you have your own Gennesaret experience, um, as Peter did. Um, there, there's a couple other slides I want to share with you as I wrap up. Um, some of you are familiar with our furniture giveaway that we've done in the past, and we stopped doing that uh, maybe three years ago now. Um, and that was a part of our larger Friends of Internationals group at, uh, at OSU. We have continued our international student lunch. Um, and I, I want to show a couple slides so that you can kind of get a picture of that. Our last one was um, Wednesday. And tomorrow night, uh, we're putting on an end-of-the-year celebration banquet for all the volunteers that have helped with um, the, the free lunch. Free lunch is held. Actually, in that, go back one, please. Free lunch is held in that building right there. It's um, owned by Chi Alpha, which is the Assembly of God ministry. Um, but they have this downstairs kitchen area. It's, a, it's an old fraternity house. So we have, we have lunch here. And uh, we'll go to the next one. 
we have a, a welcome and registration. And, um, and so uh, different people come and they'll welcome internationals. And, and, and so um, this is Dr. Shuma. He's from Nigeria and he helps every week. Uh, even though he is an international who came himself, but he knows the Lord and he welcomes these students. Next slide. Uh, we have teams from different churches that come together um, who serve meals and prepare soup. And we have a rice bowl, the gal in the pink. There's a rice dish. And then there's three or four different kinds of soup every week. And we serve um, 40 to 60 internationals and 40 to 60 Americans every, every single Wednesday. Um, next slide. African peanut chicken, chicken noodle, vegetable Thai curry. Those are the sa- soups for the day. Every week it changes. Next one. This is my friend Risa from Iran. He's a doctoral student in mechanical engineering. Um, he's a man that I've had many conversations with, and he's not interested in God comes from a Muslim background, but because of what's happening in Iran, he's just turned his back altogether. Next. Yeah, Rick and Trudy back here serving, preparing you know, food. Next one. Yeah. This is Injur. He's from Taiwan. And uh, we just sit around having conversation over a bowl of soup. It's pretty spectacular, actually. Next one. Next one. Yeah, and this would be a volunteer banquet that we did. Um, next one. I think that might be it. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I think that's all of the stories that I want to share. I mean, there's, there's more for sure. I could go on ad nauseum, but I'm not going to. Uh, the, the, the really the thing that I want to lay out before you this morning is where are you fishing? Where are you fishing? And who are you trusting for the outcome? Um, I, I want to encourage you to, to cast your line, to cast your net, and just ask the Lord to give you uh, a catch. Let me pray. Father, we thank you. Um, God, our little fishing holes um, are, are really insignificant in the, in the grand scheme of things, but they're very significant to us. And Lord, because... I know that they're significant to you. And um, Father, I pray that you would give us favor and that you would give us um, willing hearts, open eyes, open ears to see where you're at work, that we would join you in that work, knowing that you have a harvest of souls that we don't have to labor uh, all night long for. Um, But if we can just simply see what you're doing, trust you in it, and be available and willing to to go where you'd have us go, to share what you'd have us share, to love in the way that you've loved us. Um, Lord, that there would be a harvest. Um, So Lord, I just pray that you would encourage us with that word, that you would make us, uh, even this morning, fishers of men and women, uh, children um, of internationals. Give us a heart for the lost, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name.